number 245. 245. Stand with us, please, as we sing this song. This time we're going to have the Gilberts come and sing for us. May the Lord bless them.
this time the old redemption singers are going to sing for us. They're old people now. You know. It's the old group, and they're going to sing, May the Lord bless them. Thank you, Sam. I'm old. shouldn't it? Hey Amen. One of these days we're going to heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. No more property tax up there. Amen. No more light bills and heat bills and medicine bills. And we won't have to get any prescriptions up there. We're going to have a new body. Amen. Praise the Lord. Some of us need one, don't we? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Pardon me? That, that's exactly right. That's true, brother. Praise the Lord. I remember Brother Rice saying, Well, when you get to heaven, there's going to be some glorified rice. Amen. Well, he's enjoying that right now. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, if we'll just be true, church, if we'll just be faithful. We can enjoy that one of these times too. Praise the Lord. But I'm going to tell you something. We are going to be held accountable for our faithfulness. 
Amen. And we are going to have to keep pressing on. You know, this way, the Lord didn't promise a, a bed of ease. He didn't say, well, every day when you get up, it's just going to be glory. We've heard so much prosperity preaching that we think that Christians don't have to go through anything. Everything's just glorious and wonderful. You ought to try telling that to Job. Now, I will tell you this much. The worst day you have serving the Lord is better than the best day you had serving the devil. But we have to keep pressing. We have a job to do. And there's a lot of wimps and a lot of sissies around that just throw up their hands in despair when the way gets tough. You know, that's exactly right. You say when the way gets no, it's really when they don't get their way. <laughs> well, we don't want to get on that yet, do we? All right. Let's turn to God's Word tonight over in the 15th chapter of St. John. 15th chapter of St. John. We have 17 verses of Scripture that we're going to read in our hearing tonight. And then we'll stand for prayer, okay? Give you a chance to rest. Some even act like that you kind of need that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's a plenty warm in here tonight for me. <laughs> All right, chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now, this is the words of Jesus. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth forth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye, abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And the men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Let us look at verse 5 for our text tonight. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Let us stand for prayer. I want to talk to us tonight on the subject of the fruitful life. The fruitful life. Lord, again, we thank you for the privilege of being in God's house. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that we have felt tonight. We know, Lord, that sometimes in our own physical body, we may not be anxious, Lord, just to keep pressing, but there's something down within the spiritual heart of ours that says, Oh, God, we want to keep pressing. 
We want to keep going this way. We want to be what you want us to be, Lord. We want our lives to be fruitful for you. One of these days we can hear those words of welcome, well done. Now we ask that you'll help us tonight. You know exactly what we need. You know our congregation. You understand all of us, Lord. And we ask that your will can be accomplished in our hearts and lives. That you, Lord, could have first place. And you, Lord, could come and minister tonight as you'd be pleased with. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you'll permit me tonight, I'm going to take my coat off. That's something I very, very rarely ever do, but I'm plenty warm up here. The fruitful life. Well, preacher, what in the world do you preach about and, and what do you try to study after you have a revival meeting? Well, what's revival for? Well, revival is for you and I to be revived, to be stirred up, that our, our lives can be brought into focus because we are all human beings. The children of Israel, as they would walk with the Lord, and then it wouldn't be long until it seemed like that they would trust in them all, their own selves. They wouldn't hearken into the word of the Lord or the voice of the Lord. And it wasn't long until they were troubled again. And life is true. Every one of us, we go through life. Our life is like cycles. You know, we're not always up, but thank God we're not always down. Amen? And so, Lord, help us after coming through revival and you receiving help and me receiving help that we can use that as a, a as the old timers would say, chalk the wagon, you know. Put a log under the wagon and piece of, put a piece of wood or something under the wagon to, to chalk the wagon so that it doesn't go back down the hill. That we can go a little farther and chalk it again and go a little farther and chalk it again. And that's exactly what we need to do as a church. We need to chalk where God has helped us and how that He's brought us up the road in revival meeting. And then we need to keep pressing as we sang tonight and put in another chalk down and pressing as we sang tonight and put in another chalk down until we can be fruitful for the Lord. You know, it's not like, Mother, may I? May I take one step forward? And if you get to say, Mother, may I, you don't get to take, you have to go back to the beginning. You all remember playing that game? Huh? Well, that can't, we can't allow our spiritual lives to go through this, Mother, may I? We need to walk carefully before God, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and doing our part to advance the kingdom of God. Church, I really believe it's not going to be long until Jesus comes back. I really do. What we do, we must do it quickly. Amen. All right. Let us notice. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now, spiritual life and full and fruitfulness depends upon us abiding in Christ. Now, abide has several meanings. First of all, it means to stay. Over in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 5, Abraham told the young man to abide or stay ye here, and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship. It means to dwell or to live in a place, Laban said to Jacob over in Genesis 29 and 19, Abide, dwell or live in a place with me. It means to continue. Jesus said over in John 14 and 16, I will give you another comforter that he may abide, that he may continue to be with you forever. It means to wait over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 30, 23. Paul says that the bonds and afflictions abide. They wait for me. It means to rest. Over in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. And he that hath it shall abide. He shall rest. He shall be satisfied. And it means to stand firm. Over in Psalms 125 and verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. Which cannot be removed but abide. It stands firm forever. 
Now, after Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, in the next four chapters, you will notice that he was trying to explain some things to them that they didn't really understand until after Pentecost. There were only a few of the multitude saved, and Jesus left his work for the disciples to do, and also those that would hear and follow him. He promised them a comforter, or one that would come and help them in the great task. You're not alone. I want you to know you're not alone in your fruitful life. The comforter has come and, and is one that walks along beside us and helps us. If they failed, who would take up the torch and spread the gospel? Now, why didn't Jesus just send the angels down to spread the gospel? Well, the reason was they knew nothing about salvation. And Jesus needed to explain to them of the fellowship or the union they had with him as he had with the Father. I am sure, uh, I'm sorry, he promised to go away and prepare a place for them and come again that where he was, we might be also. I am sure that it was a comfort and, and, and then to say, not only would he send the comforter, but he would say that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen? Now let us notice, first of all, the words I am. The words spoken to Moses were in that present tense over in uh, Exodus 3 and 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus saith thou, say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. So I am is the present tense. He said, I am the vine. The present tense of I am the vine. <coughs> it's awful dry up here tonight too. So there must be a strange and a barren vine. Isaiah 5 and 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. In Hosea chapter 10 and verse 1, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. You see, after Israel failed, who became God's plant for bearing fruit? The Roman writer said in 11, 11, I say then, they have stumbled that they should fall. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. He goes on and says that he does the pruning and he does the purging. And the word purging here means to cleanse. Every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That is not my job, nor is it your job to cut people off. It's God's job. We have a tendency, if we're not careful, we pretty quickly judge people, maybe even by their appearance or maybe by their spirit. But it could be that God is the one that's doing the purging and God's the one that doing, is doing the cutting off and God is the one that's doing the cleansing. Lord, help me not to be the judge. Although we are fruit inspectors, the Word says we shall know them by their fruit. But it's not up to you and I to cut them off or purge them or cleanse them. That's Jesus' job. Every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. He cleanses it. That it may bring forth more fruit. Now how does he cleanse it? Well, the word says, Now you are cleansed through the word which I have spoken unto you. I remember when Grandma Wagner was living she used to let us come down and pick grapes off the grape harbor. Oh, we love those grapes. I don't know where that harbor is still there. Probably the young people that live there now don't know anything about taking care of pruning that, that uh, uh, grape uh, vineyard there. But 
I can remember as you'd go down there, there were sometimes there would be clumps of, of, of grapes that would fall to the ground. They were good, but you had to pick them up and you had to clean them before you could eat them. I remember my wife, you'd say, now you need to wash those. You need to wash those. You know, I probably ate more while I was picking than I did after I got done picking. I, I just enjoyed that. But there was a cleansing time. There was a cleaning. There was a washing. The psalmist said, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed therefore according to thy word? Ephesians 6.26 That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. God he says, God takes away all the backsliders, non-fruit bearing branches, lest they encumber the vine. Meanwhile, he sanctifies the regenerated the fruit bearing branches in order that they may bear more fruit. So God knows how to prune us and He knows how to purge us and He knows how to clean us that we can bear more fruit. And that's exactly what happens many times during revival meeting. When we get desperate before God. You know what folks? The only way that we're ever going to be uh, fruitful for God is to be be willing to bear our hearts out to Him and, and uh, be willing that we must have God to come and talk to our hearts. Amen. Show us anything in our lives. Show us where we need to back up and say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Oh, you say, but preacher, you don't understand. If I say that, those people will think they're right. Well, I want to tell you something. They think they're right anyway, and they could be right. And we need to be careful that God, we allow God to purge us and prune us until we can be fruitful for the Lord. I'd rather step over the mark of being more conscientious and saying I'm sorry than stepping on the other way and not saying that I'm sorry and holding grudges and, and allowing walls to be built up between me and individuals. Amen. I want to just tell you something. In case you don't know it, there is no perfect church. And if you find it after you go there, it won't be perfect any longer. Evan Hopkins says that practical holiness is put forth before you in the Scripture under the figure of fruit. And so God's taking the example of fruit to show to us what real holiness is like, the fruitful life. He said, I am the vine. Secondly, let us notice, but what really is fruit? Well, it's the deposit of the sap. It's the final resource of, results of all the inner activities of the tree. The outcome of the hidden life, which, which beginning with the root, passes through the stem into the branch, and finally manifests itself in the blossom and in the fruit. How are we going to be fruitful Christians? Well, I'll tell you how. It's when we allow... God to be the true vine from the inner sources of our heart and it will flow through us until we can be fruitful for the Lord. I want to tell you something. There's nothing that will come out of that heart but what's in there. You can't think it. You can't plan it. You can't work at it. Unless you have a pure and a holy heart, there's not going to be that which is pure and holy coming out. You can dress it up. You can even put a top coat on it. You can place a hat on it. You can do anything you want to. But I want to tell you something. Unless there's a pure heart on the inside, there's going to be things that are ugly coming out of that heart. Amen. The, the fruit, the fruit only bears what is the inner part of man. When fruit is formed and ripened, the great purpose of the tree's activity and growth is reached and life has completed its cycle. Fruit, therefore, illustrated that side of a spiritual life that is sacrificed for the good of others. Fruit is the produce of the branch by which men are refreshed and nourished. The fruit is not for the branch, but for those that carry it away. We are fruitful lives. It's not for us, but it's for those that we come in contact with. Amen. Amen. I tell you, the life that's filled with the divine love of God, the life that is filled with the blessed Holy Spirit, 
He wants to display the fruit of the Spirit. Not to say, look at me what I can do. But He wants to display the fruit of the Spirit that it might be helpful to others. That there might be a hunger. That there might be a thirst. That there might be a longing. Here is an individual that has displayed themselves as Jesus would. And I'd love to have what that individual has. Amen. You hear a lot about people saying, well, if that's religion, I don't want anything to do with it. Have you ever heard that before? But I want to tell you, the life that is fruitful, there flows from it. Praise God. One of the songs I believe uh, talks sometime today about honey. Well, I want you to know that person that's filled with the blessed Holy Spirit flows from the inner part of man. That sweetness, that honey, that beautifulness, beauty, beautifulness <laughs> that radiates their life because they are a fruitful individual. Fruit bearing, uh, fruit bearing trees live not for itself, but wholly for those to whom fruit brings refreshment in life. Did you understand that? Fruit bearing trees live not for itself. The branch exists only for the sake of the fruit. Holiness is not an imitation. It's possible to perform duties and do good works and call them fruit. If you were to tie a half a dozen bunches of grapes on your old umbrella, that would not make it a vine. You may tie them on carefully, but they will not grow. And that's just what the multitude of people are trying to do today. Practical holiness is not something that begins by doing, but by being. We have all of this preaching about works and, and doing something for the Lord until you have individuals that are doing rather than being. Lord, help us. I want you to know something. If you are part of the vine, and if you have old-fashioned holiness on the inside, you'll be willing to do, but it'll first become that you're willing to be what God wants you to be. And you can be a lighthouse for Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. Paul says that we might be fruitful in every good work. Our service should be the direct outcome of a divine, indwelling, vital principle. It is possible, possible to be zealous and active and busy in good works and yet continue to be unfruitful. Where there is a real fruit, the current of activity will flow through the center of the vine to the circumference. Oh, God help us. That's one reason we have a revival meeting around here. That we get the inner man satisfied with God and revived until we're not just going through the form and the fashion and not just doing things out of duty, but we're doing it out of pure love to God. Until our lives can be faithful to God. Oh, God help us. Help us to be fruitful. Fruit is that sap that comes from the vine. Thirdly, let us notice what is the source of practical holiness. It must be a source for every river has a spring. In, in vital union with all fruit, there must be a root. Not your own renewed nature. Through the Holy Spirit, a spiritual nature is imparted. But this, is, this does not produce the fruit. The branch bears fruit, but the roots produce it. It's the love of the Spirit. Love or the fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. What beautiful fruit. But Christ Himself is the source of this fruit. Hosea chapter 14 and verse 8. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do any more with idols? And I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. For me is the fruit found. He is the life. He is the spring. He is the root, the vine, the rain, the sunshine. And all that is needed to produce fruit is it's Christ living within us. Oh, preacher, it just seems like everything I do, it just it doesn't work. Preacher, it just seems like I'm... I'm not being fruitful. Well, have you checked up to see if Jesus is living within you? Are you just trying to do it on your own? Are you just going through a fashion and a, and a form of serving the Lord? Or is there a vital, living, springing relationship within your soul? 
I want to tell you something. You just don't get that just coming to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. It takes an everyday relationship with the Lord. Amen. It takes a constant pressing. As I mentioned before, serving the Lord isn't easy. You've got to work at the job. Kind of like brushing your teeth. I must be an odd fellow, but it seems like every time I brush my teeth, and especially if I don't use AIM toothpaste, I gag. I'm serious. We bought some toothpaste that was a little bit cheaper and I told my wife, I said, I'll be so glad when we get done with this because what I, I actually, I gag, I really do. I, I can't, I don't know what it is. I, I must have a funny mouth or something and I, I would brush my teeth and just the taste of it just, oh, I just couldn't hardly stand it. I'm serious. But do you think I quit brushing my teeth? No, I didn't. You want to know why? It's because I want to have friends. And if you don't brush your teeth, you don't have friends. Amen? Amen? Need to spread the word, okay? I've always thought I'd love to have, a, I'd love to have the nerve sometime to preach a message on how you ought to cut the hairs in your nose and how you ought to cut the hairs in your ears and <clears throat> all this kind of thing. But, you know, it's kind of hard to go up to your friend and say, why don't you cut the hair in your nose? Why don't you cut the hair in your ear, you know? But anyway, off the subject here, let's get back to what I'm talking about. It, it's an everyday job. I, I have a little trimmer that I use on my, my ears to cut the hair. And I have a little trimmer that I use on my nose that I cut my... But, and, and you know, I, it really kind of gets, it gets boring sometimes just in going... Yeah, 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 yeah. But I have to do it. If I don't, I'd look like some other people. And I don't want to look like some of those other people. You say, well, what are you trying to get across? I'm trying to tell you to work, to be a fruitful Christian. It's work. It's not just because I get up in the morning and I just don't feel like reading my Bible and praying. I have to get into the Word. I have to pray. I have to, whether I feel like it or not, I have to work at the job if I'm going to be fruitful. Amen? Amen? I wonder what would happen if the preacher would come over to your house and look at your Bible. Would it have a lot of dust on it? Amen. I wonder how many calluses we have on our knees. Now, I know some of you can't kneel. That's had knee surgery. <laughs> I understand that. But you ought to have some calluses someplace else then. Come on. Come on. You know, we want to come to church and we want to feel good at church and we want everything to go our way. And, and we want, you know, life to be perfect. But I want to tell you something. Life isn't perfect. And you and I have to work at the job if we're going to be fruitful for the Lord. God, help us. I'll tell you what, if I resigned this church every time I felt like it, I'd have been gone 30 million years ago. Come on. You say, why? We can't go by feelings. We have to live by faith. And we have to work at the job. we got to work at it. We can't let just get by. You, oh, man. What would it be like if you ladies, you got up the, uh, you know, in the morning, and you said, well, I just don't feel like cooking. And John comes home from work. Oh, excuse me. We have a John here. And... <clears throat> George comes home. We don't have a George, do we? We have a George that comes home from work and, and he says, where's my supper? Oh, I just didn't feel like fixing your supper today. And George isn't going to feel too good about that, is he? We don't just do things because we feel good. We do things because we want to honor Jesus Christ. Come on. Listen, you've got to work at it. If you don't, the next revival meeting, you'll be right back here asking God to do the same thing that you ask Him to do in this revival meeting. 
you won't grow in the grace of God or the nurture of the Lord or the stature of the Lord unless you do it every day. Take it by the task and work at the job every day asking God to help you and mold you and make you a fruitful Christian for Him. Amen. Amen. Well, He's the life. He is the spring, He is the root, the vine, the rain, the sunshine, and all that is needed to produce fruit. It's Christ living in us. He's the life. John said, I in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the bestowal. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's the indwelling. John 14, 4, But whosoever drinketh of the well that shall, shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He's the outflow. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of water. He is the one you and I can't be fruitful unless we allow Him to be living within our lives, walking in that light and serving Him as we ought to be serving Him. We can't be fruitful. He is the one that makes us fruitful. This is the last stage in the fruit coming from the cleansed heart with the indwelling Christ. Remember, Christ liveth a present tense in me. He doesn't need outside help. We are like the apple on the tree. We just hang in there and He produces the fruit. Amen. You don't have to walk out and say, well, I'm going to produce fruit today. No. If you have Jesus abiding and the Spirit abiding within your heart, you will be producing fruit that day. Amen. Praise God. Some people say, well, I, 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 I. well why don't you just let Christ have all of you? What are you what are you what are you what are you worried about trying to save a little bit for yourself? Well, you don't understand my personality. You don't understand my makeup. You don't understand my will. That's the secret right there. Your will. When you turn that over to God and let him have everything that you have or ever will have, then he can produce fruit through your life. Amen. Good preaching, Brother Mowry. Fourthly, what, the, what then is it that we possess? We have in Him all the fullness, everything needed for our growth, for freshness, for abundant fruitfulness, for power, all power, all grace, all purity, all fullness, everything to make us fruitful. What then is needed to produce fruit? Well, what is some of the hindrances to that? The most serious is unbelief. When we remove this, we have removed the root of most hindrances. Oh, preacher, I just don't know if the Lord could do it for me. I'm such a strong-willed person. Well, I want you to know the Lord loves strong-willed people. Because when He has you, you know, every little bump that comes along in the way, you don't just fall over. You don't get a flat tire and have to fix it. I mean, you, you say, well, that bump may be there now, but there's one thing for sure, that's not going to slow me down. I'm going to keep serving the Lord. Well, you don't understand my personality. Well, God likes all personalities. Amen. You know, He can take that old bitter person and make them a sweetie. He can take that old angry person and make them so peaceful. He can make that person that so get even and make them so lovable. Now I want to tell you something. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. But with Jesus Christ having all of you he can make you and mold you just exactly like, like you ought to be. Amen. Praise God. What part of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have in the Christian's fruit bearing? John chapter 15 verses 1, 4, and 5 said, I am the true vine and my Father is the husband. 
And abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear forth fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine. No more than can ye except ye abide in me. We can't bear fruit. We can't be fruitful for the Lord unless we abide in the vine. Amen. I won't get into that, okay? John Wesley says, It is impossible for us to lay up a stock of holiness as we really have no holiness except we abide in Christ. Why, you can't have holiness of heart unless you've surrendered it all to God. Unless you're abiding in Him within yourself, you have no holiness. It's because of Him that you can live the holiness life. The moment we separate from Him, we have no holiness and nothing left but unholiness. Do you hear what I said? The moment, the moment we separate ourselves from Him, we have no holiness. He is the one that's abiding within us that makes us sweet and helps us to act and to react like we ought to. Amen? As I mentioned before, what's in there is going to come out. Amen? Yoo-hoo. Are you all still here? Hey, are you awake? Did you hear what I said? What's on the inside is what's going to come out. I remember that revival meeting I held for a fellow and, and it, was a, it was a good meeting and, and they decided that we ought to go on another week. And he asked me, he said, can you go on? I said, I, I can go through Friday night, but that, that's as long as I've got to get back to my church. It was during the Christmas season. I, I said, I've got to get back to my church, but I'll, I'll go through Friday night. Now, I remember that Sunday night when the lady shook hands with him and said, Preacher, you're going on another week? Well, I took off of work on Friday night because we were having our Christmas supper and I don't like it. Now, what was that? That wasn't holiness of heart. That was an old selfish will. She would have rather uh, sat around the Christmas tree and sang Christmas uh, carols and and ate ham and turkey than she would to have her, her soul moved upon a revival meeting. Amen, Preacher Mary. I want you to know the way you act is what's on the inside. There's no way around it. The way you act and the way you react is what's on the inside. Oh, you don't understand. Yes, I do. I know if Jesus is on the inside, He's going to help you act and react like you ought to. And if you don't, then you're checked and you're willing to say, I'm sorry. You know, you may not have the best judgment all the time. Amen. You know, just because we're sanctified doesn't mean we have the best judgment. Our head isn't changed. It's our heart. And sometimes our head gets in ahead of our heart. And we may do something or say something. We're sorry that we did. But the sanctified heart is willing to back up and say, I'm sorry. Right. Will you forgive me? Huh? But the unsanctified heart says, bless God, I'm just going to keep right on marching. I'm going to do my own thing. All those, what? I'm the holy one. When actually you ought to be saying I'm the unholy one. Lord help us. Well, the moment we separate from him, we have no holiness and nothing left but unholiness. There was a man who was teaching a group of youngsters uh, in camp meeting and, and, and outside there was an apple tree that had a few green apples on it. And so he told them, he said, he went out and cut the branches and he said, oh, he said, I love red delicious apples. And he said, I'm going to take this branch home. And he said, I'm going to wait until it ripens and I'm going to eat these apples. The kids said, now you can't do that. You cut it off the tree. It's going to, oh, you watch me. I love red apples and I'm going to eat red apples and they're going to be good for me. You watch me, he said. And so he laid it up on the piano for the rest of the week and as the week processed, they could see that the tree, the branch was dying. 
In the last day, he used that as an illustration. You know, when we leave the tree, when we leave that vine, life is no longer in that branch. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Verse 6 says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Reese Howell in his book on the intercessor, he relates how when he was trying to gain victory for another person's salvation, the Spirit gave him John chapter 15 and verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. It would depend on his abiding. In all cases of his intercession, he spoke of the guarding of his place of abiding. The, the scriptural key was found over in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6 said, As he has said, he abideth in me, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. He's saying if I'm going to abide in Christ, then I'm going to have to walk like Christ would want me to walk. Not like what I want. And if I'm going to hang on to the promise that if I abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done. He said, then I'm going to have to abide in Christ and be what God wants me to be. Right. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you want me to tell you why some people look like they look and act like they look and go where they go? I'll tell you why. It's because of their self-will. They won't allow the Spirit to speak to them and talk to them about what they ought to do. And for sure they're not going to let the preacher say anything about it. And boy, I'll tell you, if you start naming things, it's not long until, boy, people bristle up and they, their old backbone gets as straight as can be and they say, well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Are you abiding in Christ when you won't allow the Spirit to speak to you? No, you're not. You're walking behind light and the Word says that light becomes darkness. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that's the reason tonight some people can still go on and make a profession. But they don't have the Spirit. They're doing it on their own. They're not living by the Spirit. Amen. God help us. <laughs> In other words, it meant to be willing for the Holy Spirit to live through Him. The life the Savior would have lived. If he had been in his place. The way of abiding is keeping his commandments. He said if you keep my commandments. You shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments. And abide in his love. It's not so much the outward. But the self nature that branches remains. United by abiding. It will produce fruit through the branch. In other words the power was in Christ. And so if he lives within us. Then we can be and will be fruitful for him. Amen. Well, I've got to hurry up here, okay? How many would agree with that? Afraid to say, aren't you? Fifthly, what is the inner and the personal reward for bearing much fruit? Verse 11, These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. The real fruit God wants from us is love. Love to God and love to our fellow man. If we're to have power with God, we must first be united to Christ, if you abide in me. Second, we are to continue to abide. His word must abide in us. And third, to profit by this union, we must pray, ye shall ask. And fourth, every heavenly blessing shall continue to be given to those that continue with a loving, obedient Praying spirit, ye shall ask what ye will. Verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. This honors my Father, and it glorifies the husbandman to have strong, healthy vines producing good fruit. So God is glorified if He has strong, holy children 
freed from sin and perfectly filled with His love. It honors God if we're strong Christians filled with His love. Verse 9, And the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. This is a divine love from the Father to the Son, and Jesus wants us to have the same love. When we are saved, the Holy Spirit pours that love into our hearts. Romans 5 and 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The love of God, divine love, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Verse 10 says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment, and abide in His love. When we get this holy love, we can faithfully keep His commandments only as we abide in, and otherwise we will sever our connection with Christ and forfeit His divine love. These things have I written to you that, you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. It doesn't say half full. It doesn't say partially full. It says that your joy might be full. How's your joy level tonight? Well, physically, preacher, I don't feel much like joy. I can understand that. You know your physical condition have a lot to do with your spiritual condition. But there's one thing for sure that you can know. You can know that you have not willfully sinned against God and disobeyed Him. Amen. Well, I must hurry on. <laughs> Jesus' joy came from a heart of purity since He had no sin. And therefore, if we are to enjoy His joy, we must have a pure heart. Joy is the first attribute of the fruit of the Spirit after divine love has taken full control. Peace is next. Jesus said they would be hated, but His peace would, uh, would leave with them. With, peace is a love arresting. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Jesus loves you with a divine love, so He tells you, ye shall love others with a divine love. So much of our love is human love. And the love, that love will love you and hate your enemy, while divine love loves both you and your enemy alike. Amen. Amen. You know, you don't have to like your enemy, but you have to love them. You say, preacher, what's the difference? There's a lot of difference. People that you like, you like to be around them. You enjoy their company. You enjoy talking to them. But you know, people that are, that are your enemy, you don't necessarily enjoy being around them, but you love them. That means that you would do anything in your power to help them. Amen? You know, there are some people, if they were on fire, they wouldn't even spit on them. Because they're so selfish. They're, they're so possessed with their own self. But a heart that has divine love... Even though they're your enemy, even though you know they may not like you, you'll still love them. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful when we get to heaven that all of our enemies are right next door to us? Hallelujah! Well, now they're not going to get there if they act ugly and do wrong, but if they have a clean and holy heart, they can get there. And I want all of my enemies to make it to heaven. I don't want anybody to lose their soul. Well, now what should be the attitude of obedient Christian toward one another? That is, that we ought to love one another. Here in this chapter, we have Jesus' discourse on love. I'm just about done. It's fourfold. There is the love of the Father for the Son, and the love of the Son of the uh, and the love of the Son for the Father. Secondly, Jesus spoke of his love for his disciples as the Father loved him. Who was most worthy? Jesus loved them who were most unworthy. And thirdly, Christ deals with the disciples' love for Christ. They would prove their love by keeping His commandments. And fourthly, Jesus spoke of, of disciples love one another. He said this would be their proof for their love for Him if we love one another. Oh Lord, help us to be fruitful. Are we living a fruitful life? If the great 
fruit inspector looked at our fruit, what would he find? Lord, help us that we'll be fruitful Christians for you. Amen. Amen. Well, after this message, I would like to meet the following ladies after church in Sister Campbell's classroom. Melissa Huffer, Kim Wagner, Tracy Peck, Sherry Schuler, Beth Wilhelm, Jody Johnson, Rhonda Began, Iris Wagoner, Mary Grove, Marjorie Poe, Lisa Gilbert, Elizabeth Murray, Janice Cooper, Rhonda Poe, Bev Poe, Lisa Gardner, Kim Barnes, Katrina Durgan, and Betty Cooper. Because I feel like these ladies need what I'm preaching. No. <laughs> My wife wants to meet you immediately after the service. Lord, help us to be fruit bearers. Amen? Amen? Don't you want to be a fruit bearer? Do we really want to be? Well, then it'll take a close walk every day asking God to help us. And He will. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed.